From the moment I'm in the water, I just, the first thing that comes over me is just I'm absolutely present. Um, and that's just such a rare thing. I think a lot of times we're just battling these voices in our head and whatnot, and the minute my face is in the water, everything goes quiet and I'm only focused on what's in front of me. Then I spend a good amount of time on the surface just relaxing, just totally talking to all parts of my body from my toes all the way up and making sure that my body is completely relaxed. Um, and I just take one really deep breath of air and kick pretty strongly and just start kicking down. And when you hit about 60 feet or so, you can become negatively buoyant and then you just drop down. And the whole time I'm just kind of telling myself, just relax, just relax. Because the more relaxed you are, the more you're gonna conserve oxygen. And all you have is that one breath of air. The lessons from her underwater experiences are at the heart of much of what Kimmy Werner does. Be it on land as an artist, a culinary expert, or a public speaker, or in the ocean, hunting fish, or even swimming with sharks. Kimmy Werner, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Kimberly Miley Reiko Werner, better known as Kimmy, started her relationship with the ocean when she was five years old, living in Haiku, Maui. She tagged along with her father when he went spearfishing, at first staying on the surface of the water and shadowing him. She didn't know it at the time, but he was teaching her everything she would need to know when she grew up and decided that she too wanted to hunt fish. Would you take us through what it's like to take a breath, one breath, and then um, and hold it while you hunt fish and come back with dinner? Sure, <laughs> so I mean basically from the moment from the moment I'm in the water, I just, the first thing that comes over me is just I'm absolutely present. And even the, starting just to swim, you're already hunting because you're observing that world so presently. And, and I'm watching the little bait fish and they're telling me things, you know, and I'm looking at the bottom and the structure and the reef and that's like a road map of itself, you know, and all of it when it comes to hunting, every single thing that you're looking at, it's like a little clue or a little sign telling you where you need to go. And, um, and it just feels like, you know, it's like going to a store to get groceries. Like you know what you're hunting for, you know what you wanna come home with, and now you're reading all this information in front of you to lead you there. And when I finally do find the fish that I'm looking for, or I find the habitat where it looks like this fish will be, then I spend a good amount of time on the surface just relaxing, just totally talking to all parts of my body from my toes all the way up and making sure that my body is completely relaxed. And I just take one really deep breath of air and kick pretty strongly and just start kicking down. And when you hit about 60 feet or so, you can become negatively buoyant and then you just drop down. And the whole time I'm just kind of telling myself, just relax, just relax. Because the more relaxed you are, the more you're gonna conserve oxygen. And all you have is that one breath of air to So to there's not this. a ton of adrenaline running, I'm gonna get a fish, I'm gonna go after him, I'm just, I got this one breath, nothing like that? For me, those are always the things I have to shut off because they, it, it's right there, especially when you do come across you know, that prize fish that you want to eat for dinner, it's exciting and it's nerve wracking. You already put in all this work, you don't want to blow it. And there can be so much adrenaline running through you and that can just suck up that oxygen so quickly if you let it. So, um, so I'll even like go to the point of tricking myself where if I see a really nice fish, I'll tell myself I'm not going down there for the fish. I'm going down there to take a nap. <laughs> like I'll really say that to myself in my brain and I'll just take a drop and get down there and I'll just kind of lay down and just really try and tell myself that, like I'm just here to relax. And 
instantly that'll all in the space of a couple of minutes right yes and and that's I think what really triggers the curiosity of the fish I'm not somebody who I aggressively chase after fish I use techniques that I've learned over the years that will allow the fish to come to me and that's different from how other spear fishers pursue fish a lot of times when I go diving with other people um, yeah you definitely see just the aggression come through and the adrenaline come through and people are chasing down their fish but um, in my opinion I mean you, you can't out swim a fish right so um, it just makes so much more sense to think of techniques that are gonna bring them right to me so you you look um, harmless and relaxing. I'll do things, I'll, I'll mimic what like a ray looks like when it's feeding on the bottom. And I'll, I'll definitely just do things to imitate other creatures and it will pique the curiosity of the fish and bring them in. They'll warily come in and the whole time your, your time is ticking because you have to go soon. Um, and, but when the fish does come in close enough, I'll always then just make sure that you know I'm in range I, it's a close shot that I know where I'm aiming and that I know I can pull it off and yep and then you, you hit your target and and after that it just depends if it's a big fish it could be a really big fight it could be a really big struggle um, my goal is always to kind of make the best shot right through the brain so it just rolls over instantly but you don't always get that, you know. Do you still use three prong spear? spear I do, guns? I do. I use I use um, both a spear gun and a three prong pole spear. So it all depends. These days, I like to just use a three prong a lot more. Just um, even though you have to pull back. Yeah, I really I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy both very much. When it comes to free diving, as opposed to scuba diving, um, you know, I I kind of feel there's a lot less rules. Um, you don't have to worry about going up slow, anything like that. That breath is never going to expand and be more than the breath it was when you took it at the surface. You're a lot more limited. You might have to work a lot harder, um, but at the same time, I do feel like a, you know less goes wrong. And um, and the same with the equipment used. I mean, obviously, there's more efficient ways to hunt. I have to admit that as you talk, I, I just feel a lot of fear for you. I fear blood from fish that you've. Um, uh, speared, attracting sh uh, sharks in a frenzy. I fear um, you not realizing that your breath is up and you black out underwater. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you deal with all of these things as, as a professional in that way? Um, those things are all very real fears to have. I, um, with sharks and whatnot, I think it just, it just took repetition. I mean, after having to to be in the water with so many sharks you finally start getting used to it in the beginning when you know I remember the first time a tiger shark just came and stole my fish and I was just so freaked out that I just did you think the, the shark was coming for you I totally thought so I thought like when it's gonna come back and want to eat me and I just wanted to leave everything and get to shore um, and you know, and every time I'd see a shark, it was kind of my reaction of like, oh, let's get out of here. Take and, my fish. <laughs> yeah, take anything you want, you know, just don't take me. Um, and and then there's just this one day where, <clears throat> um, I don't know, I think I had just gotten more comfortable over time and I was fighting in this fish and this Galapagos shark came up coming in hot to steal my fish and just this hunter's instinct took over me where I was just like, no, I'm sick of this. and. I just grabbed my fish and pulled it even closer to me, grabbed the fish and just like faced off with the shark. And as soon as I did, that shark turned and wanted nothing to do with me. And I'm not saying like, oh, everyone should do this, but I have just noticed that um, <clears throat> since then, like that is what I learned about sharks is that <clears throat> if you, if you show them that you are the dominant predator, then they're going to treat you like that. And and every single time I did the, oh, take the fish and leave me alone, it would only get the sharks more interested in me. It would only make them that much punchier. And so, so once I saw that, you know, and that was like, like I said, just an instinct that took over, um, I let that instinct take over a lot more. And every single time a shark came around, whether I had a fish on or not, <clears throat> I would just really stop and see what type of energy this shark has. Are they swimming totally erratic and fast and, you know, and coming in like with aggression? And if so, that would mean that I'd have to raise my aggression to that level. And 
I'm not going to back away from it. I'm not going to curl up and be small because that just kind of symbolizes prey. And so instead, if I make myself big, if I face them off, if I- How do you make yourself big? I mean, it's just mainly, it's all body language. It really is. If I, you know, this one time this tiger shark was coming straight at me from the surface and I was like, oh God, I don't want to do this right now, but I know from experience that it's the safest thing to do. So I just faced off and just swam straight at the tiger shark. And it's just like playing chicken. And, um, and then sure enough, I just turned the last minute and was uninterested. Um, and it's just the same, it's just mainly your body language um, and, and just the direction of which you're swimming. You know, prey usually isn't gonna swim directly at the predator. And so, so. So you're notifying the shark that you're not prey. Right, and it, it's the same like when I talk about hunting the fish. You know, when, I, when I, I'm hunting the fish, I notice that it doesn't help me if I'm gonna swim at the fish because that's just saying I'm a predator and the fish run away. Kimmy Werner became such an accomplished free diver that she decided to test her skills on a national level. She won competitions and discovered that it created a very different relationship with the fish that she had hunted previously for food. You were a sensation on the free diving tour competition, um, but then, and it looked like I mean, you were just winning and you were just, everyone was talking about you and then you dropped out of it. What mm -hmm. happened? Well, that was, that was all um, the spearfishing competitions that I was doing. <clears throat> and it started off as such a beautiful thing for me. I had um, fallen into the hands of some really great mentors that just helped me so much. And before I knew it, you know, I, I just um, was becoming really good at spearfishing and, and then I heard of, you know, all these tournaments and stuff, and I definitely wanted to see how I measured up with other divers and, um, yeah, entered the national championships and won that and just went on this. Won every, I think you won every category I you did. entered in the yeah. national championship in Rhode Island. Right, yes, and that, that was, that will always be a, such a special time for me because I set a goal and, I really wanted to go there and represent Hawaii and just see where all of these passions, you know, could take me. And um, and everything came into play during that tournament. Everything I learned from my dad, everything I learned from <clears throat> other mentors, all the canoe paddling I had done. I mean, it was a kayak competition where you have six hours. And I just remember, you know, how good it felt to be on a kayak and just like, knowing my way on the ocean surface and knowing my way underneath and even if I wasn't, it was my first time ever diving outside of Hawaii. It was so different and it definitely didn't come without struggle in my days of trying to figure it out. But on, on tournament day, everything worked out and I ended up winning just, yeah, across the board. And you continued to compete and then, and then you were done with it. I did, I continued to compete for a while and um, you know, in that first tournament, that first national championships, that was really special. And coming back home to Hawaii was just the best feeling in the world because Hawaii is just the most supportive, loyal, wonderful hometown, I think, that anyone could ever ask for, in my opinion. And um, the way that people supported me was something that I just was so grateful for. But I think after that, it was never quite the same because I almost just felt like, I just always had a title to defend, you know, or like after, you know, I, I did continue to win in competing, but it was just never as fulfilling to me. And, um, and I noticed that even when I would go diving, you know, on my own just for food, all I was thinking about was competition and all, you know, I started to think of fish as points mm -hmm. rather than even as food. And once I realized that I didn't, I didn't like it. I just realized it's changing me. You know, it's changing this, this thing that's so sacred to me. It's something that my parents, you know, taught me these values through this. And, um, and it's not about these values anymore. It's really about trophies and winning and recognition. And this was the thing that really made my life fulfilling again. Am I really gonna do this to it? Am I gonna take it to a level where it's all about, you know, chasing, chasing titles? Like I, I, I didn't like that. And um, so just for those own personal reasons of, 
of how I found it affecting me, um, I did walk away from competition. I, I saw you do a, a TEDx talk, and mm -hmm. um, you, you said that even though um, even though you knew it was the right thing to do, it didn't mean that other people weren't very disappointed mm -hmm. in you, and that you you felt really bad about it too. Oh, definitely. I mean. It was it was one of the toughest things I've done because it was right in, you know, the peak of what it felt like, what could have been my career. You know, I had sponsors now and, you know, people that believed in me, people that looked up to me and um, and all of a sudden I was just going to walk away from it. And um, it, it, it let down a lot of people and um, definitely disappointed people and and for myself too i mean i i did feel i did feel a sense of you know confusion because i felt so lost i didn't i didn't really know who i was without without that i it had become so the tunnel vision of my life and pretty much you know everything that was confident building seemed to come from that department it was the first time where you know my art started to sell more because my name was out there more and it just seemed like it was something that was causing so much personal gain that for me to turn and walk away from it, um, I definitely felt like a loser. You know, I felt like a waste of talent and I felt like I didn't quite know if I would like, you know, I didn't know the effects it was gonna have. I didn't know if it was, you know, how much it would bum people out or if I would just never be really supported again, really. Did you have a sense of what you would do to replace the competitions? All I just told myself is I want diving to always give me that feeling that I had of bringing home those little fish, you know, on that first dive and knowing in my heart that I was happy and proud of that and that I felt satisfied with that. And that's the feeling that I wanted. I didn't quite know what type of path that would take me on or how it would affect my career. Um, but I just knew I wanted that back. I wanted to go in the water and not have the pressure <clears throat> of competition on my shoulders and not look at a fish and calculate how many points it would be worth. I wanted that gone. What happened then? I, it took me a while actually. It, it was probably a year um, where a lot of times I would go out diving and all of a sudden it wasn't the same happy place it used to be. You know, when I say I'm totally present in the moment and those voices in my head go quiet, <clears throat> It, it wasn't happening. These voices were just telling me I was a loser and I was a failure and, you know, what are you doing? Like, why are you quitting? Um, and it was still, you know, looking at the fish's points. And so then I'd have to get out of the water with no fish. And then I really would beat myself up. Like, I am not even good at this anymore. I don't even, I can't even dive because my mind's all messed up. And, um, and I got pretty depressed, but, um, but, you know, but through that, you know, I just kind of took some breaks from diving and whatnot. And then this one day, um, a couple of friends of mine were just like, you need to get back in the water. Like, let's go. And so we all went out on our kayaks. And again, my brain was just still, still fighting itself. And I, I just felt like I wasn't diving the way I dive. I didn't have it anymore. And, um, and so I'm like, let's just pack it up and go, guys. I know what you're trying to do, and I know you're trying to bring me back, but it's just not fun for me anymore. And there's nothing worse than the feeling of actually being out here and it not being fun anymore. So I just want to go home. And then I said, OK, let's go. But then I said, you know what? Let me just take one last drop. And I put my spear gun on my kayak, didn't even take it down with me. <clears throat> and I just took a dive. And I had my two buddies you know, spotting me from the surface, so it was safe. But I just took a dive and um, they didn't even tell them what I, you know, I just took, told them to watch me, you know, took a dive. And I got down to the bottom and I just laid in the sand and I just crossed my arms and I put my face in the sand. And, and I laid there and I let every single critic come through my head, <clears throat> every single voice, every single thing that I beat myself up about, like I just let it come and I listened to every single, you know, put down worry, concern, fear, and they all came one after another. And I just waited and I just still waited, held my breath. Okay, what else you got? Give it to me. You know, just waited and waited and waited until there was nothing left. And when there was nothing left, there was not one more voice that could say anything, you know, that, that I, you know, hadn't already heard. Like, it just went quiet. 
And as soon as it went quiet, I opened my eyes and I'm on the bottom of the ocean and I was just back. So I'm thinking of your buddies watching you from above and thinking she's she's down there a really long time <laughs> with her face in the sand, mm -hmm. but they, they, they let you be. They did, they did. And then um, as soon as I picked my head up, I just realized like that feeling's back. You know, that feeling is back. Like, because before, to me, it was never truly about like, oh, that moment where you spear your fish, but it was the feeling that I felt when I would take a drop and just the serenity that would come over me and just this feeling of welcome home. And, and when everything just turned quiet and I was still there holding my breath and I looked up and I just saw my two friends and I saw the sun just sparkling through the ocean surface and I just looked at the beautiful ocean and hear the noise, you know, the sounds of the ocean and that was it. Um, I was like, that's the feeling. That's the feeling that satisfies me. And as soon as I came up, like I didn't even have to say anything. They knew. They knew exactly what had happened. They knew exactly what and I smiled at them and they were just like, You're back and I'm like, I'm back. And that was that. And after that then I just started um, diving for food again and just realizing like that's something sacred to me and I'm going to protect it with everything that I have. I'm gonna do everything I can to to keep this pure, even if it means no success comes from this, this is mine. Kimmy Werner was offered a rare position as a freediving ambassador for Patagonia, a high-end clothing company that promotes protecting the land and the ocean. In her travels, she seized an opportunity to swim with a great white shark to show the beauty of the interaction of species. Basically, my dive partner just started shaking my arm and screaming, and I put my face back in the water. There is a great white, literally, like, from me to you. And I just instantly, like, <clears throat> I heard myself scream, but it wasn't a scream of fear. It was more like the scream that you have when you're, like, catching a wave. Like, it was like a squeal, like, here it goes, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just swam right at that shark, and as soon as I did, she veered off thankfully. And, um, and I just think it was one of those situations where had I reacted by backing away, swimming away, like trying to scramble for the boat, I might not be here right now. And, um, but as soon as I swam at her, she just kind of backed off. And then I watched the way that she was swimming. Why do you say she? Oh, because you could tell, um, yeah. yeah, it was a female shark. Once she backed off, then I just observed her and I just saw that she was really mellow, that she was coming up out of curiosity, but there is nothing about her body language that said aggression. I mean, her fins were completely out. When sharks get aggressive, their fins come down, they arch their but, back. But remember, you're on the floor of the reef curling up, but you are aggressive. So right. can't sharks play the same game? They can. I don't think that animals are quite as manipulative <laughs> as humans. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times with animals, what you see is what you get. Um, maybe that's why I like them so much. <laughs> and um, and so, so, yeah, in watching her body language, it just became apparent that she was moving really slow. And granted, yes, yeah, she most definitely could have switched and eaten me at any second. Um, but again, she didn't leave the area, so it didn't really make sense for me to scramble back to the boat. Instead, I just kept an eye on her, and she was going down and like doing circles, but she would come up, and every time she came up, I just knew, okay, I have to swim down. I have to show that I'm just as interested in her. But this one time, she had slowed down, and she leveled off right in front of me, and I had hit that negative buoyancy point where I was already sinking no matter what. So at this point I had two options and it was I could make a drastic turn and kick back up, which I'd have to kick back up to the surface, which didn't sound like a good idea, or basically I was going to cross the path of this shark. And so once I realized I was, I'm like, well, whatever you do, just make it smooth. And as soon as she came under me, I just reached out, let her know I'm right here touched her dorsal fin, and we just went for a swim together. <laughs> uh, and, and it was fine with the shark? It was crazy how fine it was. I mean, if that animal, a 17-foot great white shark, didn't want me touching her on her back, I'm sure she'd let me know. <laughs> but, um, but it was amazing. I just felt her and this huge animal. You could just feel this calm energy, and she just even slowed down even more to the point where her tail was barely moving and we were just gliding together. Well, if, if the shark recognized you as another predator, 
wouldn't you be considered competition for food? Same food? You definitely can be, and I've seen um, some sharks be territorial, and again, it's just one of those times where it's like, you need to just hold your ground until you can get to a safer place. Um, but in this case, no, I don't think this, this big lady had any problem <laughs> with getting her own food, and so I, I don't think that it was anything territorial or anything competitive. I think we were just <clears throat> two predators swimming together. Kimmy Werner travels around the world working on film projects, speaking, diving, and meeting people who, like her, are living sustainably and thriving in nature. Mahalo to Kimmy Werner, currently in 2016, a resident of Waialua, Oahu, for sharing your love of the ocean with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha, ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I think a lot of times we go into jobs because we're so passionate about our craft and then before we know it, um, you know, we're, we're just we're not really enjoying it anymore and we're going through the motions because we're trying to we're trying to hit these certain marks of society whether it's financial success or I need that house or I need that car and before you know it it's your own beautiful passion that kind of becomes this vehicle for living unauthentically and um, and doing things based on expectations that were never really yours to begin with.